and want to officially welcome you all to our last uh, virtual training session that we're doing, our virtually together for the MCA. Um, it's good to have you here. Um, following today's um, presentation, we're going to have an evaluation that is sent out to people just to get some feedback from you about how this has gone, what you liked or didn't like about it or would do differently or add to it for future if we have to do this or even um, you know, even when we can meet in person, is there a need for us doing some virtual training sessions to get more people involved um, that we've all seemed to have, have mastered the art of Zoom meetings and knowing everybody's only like one inch tall. <laughs> um, so thank you for joining us. Um, reminder that we are recording this. Keep your mute on throughout if you're able to do so, please, just to keep any other background uh, noise away. And I would like to welcome today, we've got um, two guests who are presenting today. Um, Connor Truman, who is a board member, past camp director and camp staff growing up in Camp Lifer. She will be leading us in the um, uh, pre uh, preparedness for accreditation, how you do that, um, what's required. And before that, um, I would like to welcome also from Recycle Everywhere, um, Melissa DeRota, who is here, and she is going to be doing a short um, up to 10 minute presentation just about some things Recycle Everywhere, of which I'm going to shamelessly say, look what you can get from Recycle Everywhere just delivered today to our office. These little um, collapsible recycle bins are fabulous take with you on the road. Melissa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, would you like to share the screen and then I can put the presentation up? Awesome. All right. Thank you. I will be brief. I know you have a, a busy um, meeting here. I just wanted to let everyone know that our program, Recycle Everywhere, from from the Canadian Beverage Container Recycling Association um, has supported your organization and your camp since 2010, since we began. Um, so our goal is to increase the recycling recovery rate of beverage containers um, up to 75%. So we are a not-for-profit, but we do have a government mandate to help increase the recycling recovery. Uh, so with that, um, every time you buy a container, there's a one to three cent fee. All of those fees go to our program and we're able to implement our education program and give you free recycling infrastructure. Um, we also give signage, technical support. We have um, different programs and delivery modifications. So some of the free programs we have is recycling for workplaces. We have a recycling program for schools. We have an event street team that can come out to any of your events throughout uh, your camp year. This year being a little different with COVID, we've had to pivot as everyone else had. Um, and then we have some at home programs. We have free recycling bins for apartments and condos, and then as well um, at home bins. So we're slowly distributing a bin to every household in Manitoba. So if you haven't received one yet, it will be coming to your community soon. So recycling at your camp, um, as Kim had uh, shown you, the recycling bin bag, it's collapsible. Um, we have a very limited quantity this year. We only have about 10,000 units. So we usually go through 100,000 a summer. Um, so if you have not placed your order for that, the deadline is tomorrow. Um, and you can order as many as your camp needs. I would say order extra, just in case the program doesn't continue in the future. But you can distribute those to your staff, to all the camp kids. Um, it's just a great little resource that you can recycle where, wherever you are on the go. Um, and then we have our public space bins. So recycling bins for any area in your camp. So the canteen, the beach, a trail, you name it. Um, and those we're trying to get pushed out again, the application deadline is tomorrow. Um, one of the things that we're focusing on this year is really trying to echo materials that are not accepted in the recycling stream. We have so many single use items. Everything has a little recycling symbol on it, but it doesn't mean that it is recyclable. Um, so we, we always say check your local municipality, um, but usually anything with the numbers one to five on it um, is recyclable. So the not accepted items we want to stay away from, the open cups, those red solo cups, fountain drinks, coffee cups, 
And then some of the not so obvious ones, some people, some people still try and recycle propane containers in recycling bins and those need to be taken to a depot. Obviously they're hazardous material. Um, and then I just wanted to end by letting you know, we have this brand new app. Um, and if you download the app and you have it on your phone, every time you recycle, you, you take a picture of the recycling bin and then you take a picture of the barcode on your container. And every time you do that, you get entered into winning. There's daily prizes, weekly prizes, and then there's a $5,000 prize every month with the grand prize being, I think it's, I want to say it's ten or fifteen thousand dollars. I'm not involved specifically in that program, but there's just a ton of prizes. So we had a big media launch for this last week, and um, this kid won. He's eighteen. He's just starting university. He won the weekly five thousand dollar prize, and it was just so perfect. He said he's putting it towards his education. So um, it's really great. You're just doing whatever you're already doing for recycling, but you could be um, entered to win a prize every day. So encourage you to spread the word about that app as well. That is the long short of it. Please let me know if you need any help or support with your camp for recycling. If your camp doesn't have recycling access, I can help bridge that gap for you and find a way to get recycling in your area. If you need education or promotional items or just anything at all, feel free to contact me. We're a free resource and there's not too many things that are left free in this world. So I encourage you to do so. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, I think that's great. Um, just seeing all those, that, that's a huge incentive, right? Is doing the picture piece that way um, on your app that you have out now. Why not, right? Chance to win. And like you said, an 18 year old won that money. Anybody could win. Is, is it a, just a Manitoba Recycle Everywhere contest or is that a na national one? It's just Manitoba and I know you do have a few camps in Ontario. Our program is the first of its kind in the world and we're only in Manitoba. Um, however, it, we can just keep this between us. We do have government approval to move into Ontario. So we will be in the Ontario camps within the next year or two. So, Awesome. That's great to know. Um, are there any questions from the group at all for Melissa before she heads out? You can just unmute yourselves if you have. I'm not seeing the whole screen right I'm, now. I'm just wondering um, if we already have like some bear proof recycling bins, are we able to get more? Are we able to order more or what does that look like? Yeah, for sure. So um, an, um, an email would have gone out to you guys, but if you didn't receive it, um, we are accepting orders for seasonal recreation and campgrounds and cottages um, with the deadline of tomorrow, um, just because our quantities are so limited. So we do have those bear proof bins. Those are $1,500 a piece, but they're free for you as long as you're matching them up with waste bins. So get that order in ASAP today if you can. And it's all on our website, the application, everything. All Thanks that information that, went out in the last campaign. If anybody uh, didn't get it, let me know. On Thursday, I do believe that was, we sent it out this week. Yeah, so do it. Why not get free stuff, especially at camps to be bear wise, that's fabulous. Do the bins um, get delivered to the camp or is there a pickup space or place or how does that work? Yeah, everything is delivered right to you. So on the application form, we just need to make sure that you are matching up the recycling with garbage that you're actually recycling the material. So there's a way to remove it. Um, and then we just deliver it to you in two to four weeks. So that's that's also the rush to get everything together um, by mid and April. So we can actually get you the bin bags and the recycling bins in a timely manner. Um, these seasonal areas are busier than ever with COVID. And I know that's a little bit different with camps, but I mean, you're still going to have those materials. So every anything that we can give you, please take advantage of it. In one of the slides there, there was uh, like a little pail kind of thing with a handle on it. Are those available as well? Those would be perfect for in our cabins. Oh yeah, they would. Those, unfortunately, those are for um, apartments and condos. Um, but we do have smaller bins. So when you go to our website, um, you can look at all the different bins and there's 20 different kinds of bins. So we do have a smaller one that's more of like 
an office kind of space size that would be perfect for cabins. I have a question. Um, you said we should be ordering um, several of the collapsible uh, recycle totes. Um, mm -hmm. I get greedy, but I also don't want to under order. So what's a reasonable amount for a camp to order? You were saying get some for giving away to families and stuff. Yeah, I mean, if you have 100 kids attending your camp throughout the whole summer, I would take 200. Um, this might be the last year of this program too, because it's pretty saturated. Um, so we keep ordering less and less. So I would say just order more than you need. You're going to fill an application out. Someone's going to call you to confirm it, but they come in packs of 25. Um, so as long as you have a place to store them, um, if you can keep some for next year for just in case, or you want to give one to all the kids, all the staff, parents, you want to give them to everyone, just take as many as you can safely store and give away. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. I am going to say then thank you very much, Melissa, for being here and joining us and educating thank us you. just a little bit more on recycling. And that encouragement Thanks. is always useful. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. All right. I am going to turn things over then to Connor Truman, board member, past camp director, camp staff, went up going to camp, <laughs> obeyed every single rule that there was at camp. She was like the ultimate camper when she went to camp I directed. Um, <laughs> I'm, she's going to now lead our presentation on um, accreditation preparedness. So Connor, it's all yours. Hello everyone. Um, my name's Connor Truman, like Kim said, and she's right when I was a kid at camp and my cabin mates would be planning like sneak outs or something. I was not on board. I was a born rule follower. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, I've always had an affinity for what as an adult I would now call policy but um yeah so welcome to this presentation there because there are um we're a number that if you're on a computer screen I'm assuming everyone can see all of us I might kind of go in and out of sharing my screen so that if there's sometimes where we it makes sense to have a group conversation that we can all see each other and and do that um I, before I share my screen though, and kind of get into what um, we're going to talk about today, can I get a show of hands for those of you who are, have your screen up or if someone wants to comment in the chat box at all, of people who are attending this event who are consider their camp is considering becoming accredited, so you're not accredited yet, or you're, you're a director or leadership member who's going to be coming about your first accreditation kind of turn, even if your camp is already accredited. Can I kind of get a hands up if that's the case people are in? Okay, okay, great. Yeah, so as we get into things today, I know we have some, uh, yes, thank you for being here. And, and I know we also have some experienced people here who have been through a number of accreditations. And I think, and we have a couple of accreditation committee members. So I think there's a lot of experience and wisdom to draw on here. And so any questions you can think of, there'll be an opportunity to ask those and they can be as specific as you want them to be because we've got the expertise here to address it. So I'll share my screen and we'll get going. But like I said, there'll be occasions throughout for you to engage with this topic and this process. So I'm going to pull up my screen here. Um, and okay, do people see, mm -hmm. see what they're looking at? Okay, so uh, accreditation preparedness. So you're a camp director or a leader, you're involved in a camp, you know, what, what is important for you to know heading into accreditation? A little bit about me, Kim already mentioned some things about me. I am a former camp executive director. I was a camp executive director at Luther Village. You can see the sign in Caroline's background there um, uh, for a couple of years in the past. And then I have other years of uh, work experience there. I am a current Manitoba Camping Association board member. 
And I have experienced the camp accreditation process as a camp staff member, as like a program leader, you know, watching the group go around the camp, um, as a, a leadership staff member, as a new executive director. So my first summer there as executive director, we had an accreditation visit as you would with a, a new director and as a board member doing site visits. So I've experienced this from many different angles and, and hope to share some of that. Um, a bit about the people here today. Um, I know we're, I, I, people's time is precious. So um, we, I know we have some new leaders here. We have some people thinking about becoming accredited camps. I know we have some experienced people here. So we've got a, a, a variety and, it, um, and I'm hopefully we'll meet everybody throughout this, but I know kind of we're, we're in a crunch. So um, I did find a couple of co comics to show you. I don't <laughs> about going to camp. I don't know if anyone can read this uh, comic on your screen, but I thought we'd start things a little light, a little lighthearted. <laughs> what will we do without Wi-Fi? Um, Anyone concerned about copyright issues? I did contact this comic creator to ask for permission to use these comics. I have not heard back yet, um, but that's my disclaimer about that. So. so today we're going to talk about camp accreditation. And I really hope to kind of demystify the process for people, um, help you get a sense of what is the spirit of this? Why, is, why do we accredit camps? What can the MCA do and be for you? What you can do to prepare for a visit, what to expect at that visit, how it, what happens after you have a camp visit, and then kind of, okay, now what? How do I get going? What are some first steps I can take? That's what I'm planning on talking about, about today. So why accreditation? And I'm going to pull out right now my, this slide, I have a quote in here, and I pulled it directly from, this is just my home printed version though, but um, the MCA has a brochure, kind of a little snapshot of um, the accreditation process. It's available on the website. Um, Rick and I talked about, it. if you're able to put the link in the chat box, Rick, during this presentation, that would be great. But it just gives a little snapshot of what accreditation looks like. And I use this to, to kind of plan a little bit for today. Um, but the idea here and the quote that I pulled out is that the purpose of accreditation is just to really ensure that camps are following best practices outlined in the standards manual. This is not only a Manitoba thing. So we have these Manitoba standards, but provinces across Canada, states in the US have a credit, similar accreditation processes. These things don't happen in isolation to each other. So um, when I say best practices, I don't just mean things that some camps in Manitoba have kind of come about or up with. We're informed by a wider, broader industry than that. Um, so as with any professional industry, which some camps are an, an industry, um, the MCA is here to strengthen and support and represent that industry. And accreditation is a way to help your camp ensure you're participating in best practices, kind of have um, a support in, in, be, in being the best that you can be. And it also gives the public um, confidence in knowing that your camp is um, open to kind of external organizations helping you do the be the best that you can. And I, I, I'm just going to turn to my little notes here because there's a couple of things I wanted to mention too is that it, seem, it does seem to vary province by province how accreditation impacts uh, public perception. And I do think that the MCA overall's profile is being raised publicly over the last few years. We, we have, a, I would say, a more, we become more visible. And also in this COVID time, the Manitoba Accounting Association and Kim specifically as the executive director has really become the 
public representation of your camp, kind of whether you're accredited or not, with the government in their processes on determining how do summer camps play into this. And I think we've been really fortunate here in Manitoba to have um, Kim do the advocacy and, and get to the levels she has been able to get to when it comes to speaking with government. So this is part of accreditation as well, right? Is that um, at, it's about public perception, parent perception. There are school divisions who require if school groups are going to go places that it's with, you know, an accredited camp. So there's a lot going on here, um, but I think that COVID has even magnified the value of of being able to demonstrate to the public that uh, you're interested as a camp in following best practices, you're interested in participating in an organization that's there to help you uh, ensure that you can meet new and emerging health and safety requirements as they come together. So that's a little bit about why, why and what accreditation is all about. So I'm just going to, um, I'm going to kind of, like I said, maybe whiz through some of these pieces and so we can get to people's questions. But I think what I might do briefly here, oops, oh, sorry, is um, I might stop sharing my screen briefly. And I just am wondering if anyone has any questions at this point before I get into the nuts and bolts of, of uh, accreditation and the visits and how to prepare and things like that. Do people have any questions or comments or concerns or, or hope, hopes or dreams they'd like to, to bring forward at, at this point? Okay, well, hearing none, I will uh, share my presentation piece again. Um, just turn your audio on if you do have a question. If Can I ask oh. one quick question? Yes, yeah. Um, and maybe you'll get to this in the presentation. Um, this is my first summer uh, or year, I guess, as director. So we've been accredited for a long time, but I'm new to this. Um, but this is also our first summer doing family camps. And so just in looking at some of the things, I'm just trying to figure out if there are any differences for family camps or youth things anyway. So maybe you'll get to that, but that's just something that I've been wondering just with some you know, specific things that obviously make a lot of sense for youth camps, but when parents are there, yeah. So I don't, you don't necessarily need to answer right now, but just something that I will have questions about if it doesn't come up. Great, and what camp are you from, Jenna? I saw your name there, but. Yeah, Camp Cedarwood. Camp Cedarwood, okay. Yeah, so we can address that here. So when I was executive director, I was at Luther Village and Luther Village's main programming has always been family camp. Right. And there are some interesting things that that creates on a site visit, right? Especially with what you're referring to. Well, if parents are there, how does that come into play? So yeah, we can address that um, for sure. Okay, great. Um, yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll address that when we get to the site visit section. Okay, I'm gonna share this screen again here. Okay. So, okay. So preparing for a camp visit. So the basics of this really is read through that, that entire manual, go through the checklist. Again, that's also available on the website um, just by clicking on a link. And so all of those accreditation requirements are accessible and easily available to you and parents and, uh, and anyone who wants them. Um, but a piece that's changed and evolved over time is it used to be that when you had a visit on site, you'd go through your paperwork at that point. And now um, what the um, accreditation committee would ask is that camps prepare the documentation requirement, the, the the paperwork you're required to have, and that you electronically send that to the MCA by June 1st, if I'm not mistaken, of the summer you're going to be having your visit. And um, that if I, I know for some of you, that might be the big initial hurdle if you've never, if you have not been accredited in recent years, right? If you don't already have that information done electronically, um, so that's a piece that if you have any, or if you, if you have it, I, 
A big theme I want to highlight here is if you are start this process and you have questions, you have concerns, you're confused about any of the accreditation requirements, anything like that, do not hesitate to reach out to Kim or well, Kim specifically will have the answers right off the top of her head, but Kim and the board members, <laughs> um, because uh, you know, you might say, oh, well, this document that the camp's looking for related to our vehicles being safety, well, that's happening in the middle of June. What do I do? Do I have to get that document in, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you don't need to ponder that in isolation. Please reach out to the MCA. They're, that's part of the service provided in helping you um, maintain your standards and, and grow uh, as an organization. So that's a big piece is preparing the documents. I'm just gonna to move to my next, oh, it's not letting me move to my next slide here, okay. And then the other piece is prepping your sites and prepping your staff. So by prepping your site, I mean, um, when you're going through all of the accreditation requirements, obviously a lot of that is about your spaces, your buildings, where campers are staying, where campers are eating, et cetera. Um, and you will be taking a group of people around your site to show it off and, and show them what, what your camp is all about. And so um, it may not be worth parking here for a long time, but just again, prepping your site, going through with fresh eyes. Now that I've just recently read these accreditation requirements, do, can, I, can I walk out of the office here and really notice anything? Prepping staff. Um, this is a big one because I think it's important that likely all of your staff are aware of accreditation visit is happening just so they're not confused about why there are people on site who wouldn't normally be there. Um, but also there are senior staff members that an accreditation group are going to want to speak with. They're likely going to want to speak with your whoever's in charge of your maintenance. They're likely going to want to speak with whoever's in charge of your lifeguarding staff, things like that, right? So make sure that your staff are aware. When is this day happening? We'll, we'll likely come by and speak to you at a certain point in the day. Um, if they need to be refreshed on some of that information, um, just brief them, right? So that it's not a, shock, a surprise to them or they don't feel put on the spot at all um, that day. And then when you're working with CAM to select a day for the group to come to your camp, make sure it's a day you don't have any other big things planned because it's, uh, it's a big it's a big time commitment. If you have a bunch of different groups on, if your board's having a meeting that day and you have an alumni group who plan an event or something that's going to take up your time as the leadership person, um, it, you'll find that it's uh, a lot to juggle. So I'd say you'll just find this easier and smoother and more enjoyable overall if you dedicate your time that day to what's going to be happening. And I think, yeah, I'll move on to kind of the actual visiting. Um, I, here's another comic. I don't know if you can, can you see the whole comic when I put it up like this? Can you? I thought this one was funny. Some of you may think I'm being intense or over the top, but when you're waist deep in craft supplies and your only friend is an empty hot glue gun, you'll know what to do, right? So that was my prepare your staff. <laughs> comic so so the actual site visit uh one thing i really want to convey in this presentation is that the the site visit is your opportunity to show everyone what great things happen at your camp right that's what it's all about. And I think that there's been an evolution over time as far as how this has been approached or how camps experience this, and that there's some misconceptions about this site visit being somehow um, overly legalistic or intended to almost be like we're going to come in and spot the errors immediately or something like that. And that's not the idea of the spirit of this. 
the MCA is interested in helping your camp be the best it can be and in helping the camping industry be the best that it can be, have a really good reputation, ensure kids are safe. And so this is your opportunity to say, hey, thanks so much for coming to our camp today. We're so excited to show you around. And if you have any concerns about areas of your camp or accreditation requirements you weren't concerned about, don't hesitate to bring those up because then the MCA can help you solve those and resolve those issues or understand those accreditation pieces um, better. So I really wanted to mention that piece, the sort of the site visit, the, the spirit of, of it, the intention. So like I said, you've got something special, you know it's special, that's why you work in, in, uh, in camps and tell, tell that group about it, the group who comes. Um, the group can vary in size, but I think normally you're looking at about four to six people. Would that be good? Is that correct, Kim? Yeah. And they will likely be there for at least three hours and that will include a meal or a snack time. And I think I have a non MCA related example to me being unprepared for the sort of time commitment or <laughs> involvement I as an executive director needed in something. And I think maybe it could help in this scenario. When I started my season as the executive director at Luther Village, we had been told the year before by our superior propane or what well, one of the propane companies that we had some issues with a few of our lines and that come next spring, we'd have to have those addressed before they could fill our tanks. Okay, great. We schedule the time for the, the propane person to come out and do the inspection, which I thought, well, I'll give this person a map. And, you know, they, they said, I know what they said the issue was last year and I can kind of show it to them and then they can come back to me and tell me what the deal is. And this person showed up and wanted and needed me to walk around the entire property with them. So what I had envisioned as being kind of a short time commitment ended up being five hours. I think that's what it ended up being. And so that's why I put in a minimum time here. You are going to be showing this group around the majority of your property. It's going to take some time and just be prepared for that. And if you expect that, then obviously it it, uh, it goes smoothly, but there has been times where I think people are surprised or for whatever reason, that's not what they envisioned this visit being. And, but that is really it is, is it's your job as the executive director or as whatever leadership position you're, you're in, if you're the designated person to connect with the MCA, um, then that, that's um, your commitment that day and you will be taking that group around. Um, I've already mentioned to make sure you have senior staff available for specific questions. And like I said, so the group that's coming to visit, you're going to have Kim as the uh, director of the MCA goes to all the visits, but there will be members of the uh, of the accreditation committee. And then there's also usually members of who are um, directors from other camps, former directors from other camps, other people who are knowledgeable about the industry and the, and the requirements. So that's usually the group makeup. Um, I'm going to take this time to stop sharing here. And I, so I'm gonna use a family camp example um, because Jenna brought it up and I know that some other people are considering doing family camps. And um, I'll kind of throw out an example. And then Kim, if you feel like there's some elaboration you want to make, you can. But I'll give you an example when it comes to like waterfront activities, if you have a lake or a pool or something like that. Um, often in a family camp context, uh, it would be a you might have a lifeguard for part of the day or all of the day, depending on your site. But you would also potentially have times of the day where parents are responsible for their children. Um, that's the expectation that's outlined for by, by the camp. And um, 
that would be different than than a than um, a youth camp or a children's camp, right? Where there aren't parents there, you are responsible for those children, right? So that's an example. I know when um, family camps have had MCA visits that sometimes that takes more unpacking or there's more questions around that. So fill it, give us an idea of what this actually looks like. When do you have a lifeguard on duty? What are your other waterfront rules? What are the rules communicated to families regarding um, parents and parental supervision? So um, that's an example that I encountered as an executive uh, director for sure, because at um, the camp I was the executive director, there was a lifeguard for part of the day, but families were able to use the beach at other parts of the day with very clearly spelled out regulations regarding supervision. Um, I don't know, but now can be a time if anyone has a specific scenario they'd like to ask related to that that's going to be unique to a day camp or a family camp or something other than a residential overnight camp, traditional camp situation. Go for it. If you do, I see you're raising your hand, Jenna. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess thank you for bringing up the waterfront because that would have been one of my main questions. So um, if you can, if I can just kind of elaborate a little bit on that, like what you're saying is technically like we could do something like that as long as we have our clear guidelines or whatever Kim and I talk and we figure out a happy I don't know I won't say compromise but whatever mm -hmm. um but but then with that too kind of another big thing that I've wondered is with family camps and having a nurse on site um and where does the responsibility fall on the nurse and the parent and like if that's something like how much MCA cares, not that you don't care, but whatever, like where kind of, yeah, like when it comes to family camps, um, and maybe this is a more conversation that Kim and I should have like directly that pertains more to us, but if, yeah. Well, enough. it might be something that other camps are wondering though, as they consider doing family camp. I'm gonna give my answer to my best understanding and then Kim, you come jump in if there's more clarification needed. So my understanding is that camps, uh, they're accredited by the MCA who are operating family camps do not need to have a nurse on site for family camps because ultimately, again, parents are responsible for their children in that regard. So if you have an issue and you need to go see a care provider, a parent, like, like if you are on a family vacation, would take your child and drive them to the closest clinic or something of that, that nature. Um, Kim, is that correct? Do you wanna elaborate on that at all? There still needs to be a health officer who is designated right. as that health officer person who can care for any kind of injury accidents that may potentially happen, but they need to have their um, only need to have their emergency first aid, which is what our standard is right the majority of camps go that route of getting a nurse. Um, or an EMT or, you know, whatever. Uh, if you're more than 20 minutes away from a hospital, you also need to have somebody trained in more than emergency first aid. You have to have somebody who's got the wilderness first aid 40 hour course, including the CPR piece, because it's to be able to sustain that um, person's um, health or they're keeping them safe before they're, I mean, the big word in the wilderness first aid was before they're evacuated. Um, so when that's getting them into the hospital and it could be an evacuation plan that a helicopter is to come in if it's really remote or whatever, driving to a hospital. So it's as long as you still have that person who's a designated person who can drop everything and go and take care of something because you may have situations where parents have no idea what to do when a situation happens because it's their child, their spouse, um, their parent, whatever. And so we still camp still need to provide that um, emergency response to take care of whatever that um, health crisis is. And normally, um, I know just from my experience, again, from camps and what I've heard from others who've done some family camping too, is that usually it's the parent who will take that child in. Sometimes we've had a situation where the parent maybe was dropped off and doesn't have a vehicle. And that's where the designated um, emergency vehicle at your camp comes into play in getting that person to a hospital if an evacuation isn't required by ambulance or helicopter um, or whatever. Does that, is that helpful? Does that make a bit more sense? Yeah, I think so. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for fleshing that out for us. And I will say, and this is something I was going to talk about a little bit more at the end about connecting with your other MCA resources, experienced directors. For those of you who have never um, done any family camping before and are considering it, I'd really encourage you to reach out to some of the camps who've been doing it for a long time because you're going to find programming with adults is a whole other ballgame. 
<laughs> it's a very different um, than than running programs um, that are specific to youth and children, right? So, or or only have youth and, and children participants. So, with standards for sure, but also with everything related to starting running family camps, I'd really encourage you to reach out to some of the, you know, like Luther Village has had family camps for a long time. Um, Camp Wasaga has had family camps for a long time. I know a number of other camps have kind of one or one week or a weekend of family camps. So definitely uh, take the opportunity to do that as well. But since I'm mentioning it now, I'm going to mention that I might as well uh, mention it with regards to accreditation. If you find you're halfway through that accreditation manual, you're in the first paragraph, you're on the first second page, who knows when, and you're feeling like, whoa, I, what is going on here? This is so much information. There's so much going on. I know that as camp directors often, or camp leadership members, you can feel pretty isolated. Um, you're working alone in your office, maybe on your site, maybe that site is remote and it, but there is a network of camp people who would love to help you through this process. You know, we have directors who've been directors for 10 years, 15 years, 20, 25 years, and they're going to remember what it was like the first time they had an accreditation visit. They're still doing them every three years. So they're going to know every three years they're going through this information as well. And you don't need to feel like you need to figure this out all on your own. There's, um, you can reach out to Kim as the MCA director, but if you know there's a camp down the road, I really encourage you to reach out to them. Jared, who's our board chairperson, I'm sure would happy to hear from you. Audrey from Camp RNS, who's been a longtime member of the Standards and Accreditation Committee, would love to share information with you. So I, I, I would say if there's a message to leave this meeting from when it comes to accreditation specifically, but anyone who's a new director, um, please, you are not alone. Go out and people have experienced it all, right? So definitely don't uh, feel like you have to experience this or figure this out on your own. Um, you know, I'm gonna share my screen and get through the rest here so that we can uh, answer any more um, questions as well. So your visit day, you'll have your visit day, like I said, um, I encourage you to feel excited about this day. Again, it's your time to show off. Here's some great things that happen here at this camp. You love this camp uh, that you work at almost certainly. Um, so uh, share that with everyone. And the group who's coming love camp too, right? So they want to participate in that enthusiasm with you. You will receive a report for after the visit, the committee puts all their information together. Kim writes up a final report that is then sent to the camps. Usually that's within about, it's pretty quick, isn't it, Kim, within about 10 business days? Or? Ish, yeah, it Ish. depends at what point in the summer that your um, your visit has happened. If it's the first part of July or mid-July, um, there's usually quite a few camps that are visited within the first, like within about a three-week period. So um, I, I aim for the 10 business day, but if I'm on the road a lot doing visits, it's a little bit longer, um, but for sure, like by about the third week in August has kind of been my latest um, time frame. maybe the end of August. I'm trying to remember my first year might have been later, but this year we're also, um, we're starting a new way of doing our accreditation visits is that we've got um, a program Rick has set up on iPads that we have um, that where people will be putting the information in there and then it will basically all kind of get compiled like in a jot form idea right. which will help for you yeah right. okay. and I don't have to like read through every single one and um, cut and paste or you know try mm -hmm. to transcribe what was written there so I hopefully the 10 day work day um, 10 work day working days is kind of my goal doesn't always happen exactly that way mm -hmm. Well, and I think um, here's another funny <laughs> comic if people are finding these funny about your showers not working at camp, an example of something not working at camp. Um, but uh, so with that report, you might be told, great, everything's good to go. We checked everything, um, accreditation coming your way. But what I'd like to talk about more is if you are given a report and you have some follow up pieces right, so you need to implement some changes there's elements that are not up 
to standard, right? So this is not uncommon, especially if it's a camp that's never been accredited before, or again, if it's a new new leadership who and things got you know lost along the way or things like that. So it's not uncommon. And again, I want to reiterate the MCA is here to help you figure out how to make those changes. And uh, so feel free again, if you get this report and you're like, whoa, I don't, I'm not quite sure how to address these changes. That's what Kim is there for. Kim will, will be happy to walk you through those processes. Okay, who do we need to contact about this? Is it the health inspector? Do we need to get the ropes course people out to reinspect our site? Do we, you know, they're, they, there's help with that. And then you have until the end of that calendar year to demonstrate that you've made those changes. Is it staying that way, Cam, with the new, with, yeah, that's staying the same, I'm assuming that, yeah. Ah, yes, yes, that's the, that's the hope. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that's the, the very basics of how this process essentially goes, right? So you prep things ahead of time, you get your paperwork in, you have the site visit, which as like I said, as long as you are aware that there is, it's going to be for a good chunk of the day, they are really going to want to see the whole place. They're really going to want to hear me tell them about all the different things that go on at camp and they may have questions about different things. And then you'll get this follow-up report and it will help you ensure that you can meet um, all of those requirements. If it's found on your site visit, but, that there's some things that need need some adjusting that's the nuts and bolts of how of how it this process works um if you're sitting here wondering okay i don't even know where to begin <laughs> i have i just feel like this is such a mountain to climb if your organization has never pursued accreditation before so i'd encourage you really start with your strengths if you know you've got a great waterfront activity situation going on, turn right to that section of the accreditation checklist and do that. Just start out with a win. Start out with something you know you've got. If there are whole sections of that accreditation manual that are not relevant to your site and it's going to be easier for you physically to just remove those pages from the binder you printed off or something, do that. Just start with these little steps. Um, as I mentioned before, connect with other directors um, and seek out experts. So again, if the first step for you is printing off that accreditation manual and going through it, if you have not read the accreditation manual, it is set up like a checklist so that you can read item, do I meet this item, right? So I mean, uh, that's number one. And if that and and if you want to do that today, span it over the weeks, et cetera, then at least you can start a to-do list. Whoa, I don't know if we have that, that in place on our high ropes course. Mm, I might need to call someone about that, right? So now's the time while we're all in limbo, still kind of waiting for the, the summer, that if you're considering this. Like I said, Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario is full of experienced directors who I know are happy to help you. And part of the reason I know this is because I know when I was a new director and I went to an MCA conference, I had new directors say that to me. Oh, you're new? Don't hesitate to give me a shout. Hey, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've been doing this for 20 years. Oh, you need help figuring out some things with your accounting? Give me a shout. I'm happy to help you with that. People, camp is a is can be all consuming and it is a real lifestyle type of a job decision but if you've done it for a long time you do have the capacity to help lots of people around you and it doesn't feel as overwhelming as it maybe did when you first started and i know again uh, i guess i'll say for those of you who are new to camp leadership um I know that you probably feel really overwhelmed right now, not just with accreditation, just with everything, right? And I will tell you that I, the camp, I became the executive director at Kim, who um, had been the executive director at, and I sent her text, but I would get things in the mail and I'd take pictures of it and I'd send them to her and say, what is this letter? <laughs> you know, I, so, and there are people out there who want to help you with this. 
I'll tell you a brief little accreditation visit. Uh, <laughs> not what you want story that happened uh, to me. And then I'll open it up for some conversation and questions and for people to share their experiences, but also to share their questions. Because I know, like I said, we have some experienced people here in the room who are at accredited camps, have been participated in those visits. Um, when I was a camp staff member experiencing a camp visit, Kim might remember this story. So this is another story about when you have adults on your site for things like family camp and they're much less predictable than youth and children campers and we had announced to the family campers that week there's going to be an accreditation visit this week you're going to see this group just so you know we got up to our shop which is clearly supposed to be locked all the time um, and had been locked and a couple of very long time adult campers knew some way of getting into the building from behind, got into the building, opened up the big garage door that was supposed to be locked, and we're standing there as the accreditation committee walked by this, what was supposed to be locked shop they had opened up for everyone. And they looked at us and put together what was going on and that they were not supposed to be in there at that time and said, hey there safety first <laughs> and we just kept going along our way for the accreditation visit and um i'm sure it probably needed some explaining at the time right so don't you're going to have funny things happen you're going to have um you know things come up that it's not going to go the way you had hoped and that's okay perfection is not an expectation it's really just the the spirit of wanting to be the best that you can and wanting camps to be the best that they can and to participate in an industry that we all care so much about. You know, maybe we, I know for me, camp um, impacted my life in such a huge way. I am who I am because I went to camp and because I know that, and you know that about your camps, we want people to know about camp. We want it to have a high public profile. We want people, the public, to think really positively about summer camp. And accreditation can be a way to participate in that process. So enough about that, because we're almost at one o'clock. Please ask your questions, specific or non-specific or general, any questions you have. Because like I said, there's experience here in the room. Even if we have to interrupt Andrew's phone call, we will. And I also want to say to Connor that um, sometimes there are things that do happen at camp, like that you notice or whatever, and it's, we're not going to go like, you're done. We're not accrediting you. No, we understand that these things happen. For example, we were to camp once that they didn't even realize they didn't have a lock place on their kind of maintenance shop um, like that as well. Like not this scenario you were talking about, but another one, like their main entrance. And they thought that just because they had the, a sign that said, um, staff only, it was fine. And we just talked about, well, here's why you should put a lock on the door and it is a requirement. You have gas in here, you've got these dangerous tools, et cetera, et cetera, right? A kid could wander in. So they're like, oh, we didn't even think about that. And another scenario too, the first year I had an accreditation visit when I was a leader uh, or when I was a director at Luther Village and the team that was there, we were sitting in the dining hall going through the paperwork. And I remember them, they're going through about oh, um, smoke detectors in, in the buildings. And somebody said, okay, so the smoke detector in your dining hall and they're starting to look around and I'm looking around going, oh my gosh, we don't have a smoke detector in our dining hall. We've got fire extinguishers, we've got emergency lights, we've got smoke detectors in the kitchen area and, and all those bells and whistles, but we had no smoke detectors like, oh my gosh, pull out the walkie talkie, call my maintenance staff. Hey, can you come and put a, a smoke detector here in the kitchen? And they had one installed in our dining hall within about 15 minutes. They were the best ever and our the accreditation team's like, wow, your staff respond very well to things that need to be done. So, right, it's, it's we're, we're helping to find those things that need to make camp safer, better while we're there. Does, does anyone have any questions or comments? And you can feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand or put it in the chat chat box um sorry michelle did from rock lake did you raise your hand yeah go ahead yeah 
I hope uh, I hope you haven't already answered this question and that I'm not uh, making you repeat yourself. Uh, I'm just trying to understand. So the paperwork that goes with this accreditation is only needed the year of the visit. It's not annual. Yeah. So you you don't. Kim, correct me if I'm wrong because you're more. But yeah, my understanding is you're not submitting this information every year. You do need to sign something that indicates your intention that, that you you will be following these standards for the next three years because you're that's how long your accreditation lasts unless you have new leadership. Um, but you don't need to go through a process like this, including submitting your paperwork every year. You essentially it's essentially an honor system those other two years um, uh, because it's uh, well because it, it's, uh, it's redundant. It would just be too much for you and for the MCA, um, but that's why it's a three-year span. Okay, I'm just asking because we're affiliated with the United Church and um, I've seen paperwork and I think it's yearly for them that they right. want fitting. And so I thought, is this the same? Like, do I match them up together and send them into, you know, same time? But okay, good, thank you. The only piece that we do ask to be updated, but in all honesty, it's very rare that people do update that piece is the insurance. It's just to show that they are insured again going forward. And it it isn't something that I've been sending reminders out because it's even hard enough to get just membership forms back sometimes from all our camps. So it's again, that understanding is people are signing the statement of compliance that they are doing um, still following what all of those standards are. And sometimes when I might be in your area, even if you're not having a visit, I might just say, hey, I'm gonna be close by. Do you mind we stop in? And sometimes we've just stopped in to say hi and to see how people are doing. I'm not gonna say like, oh, are you doing these things, right? But we, you just happen to see some stuff that's, that's going on as well. Are there any other questions or um, comments or like I said, hopes or or dreams or concerns. Yeah, Howard, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I just, I just like to say, I, I know I've been through three or four inspections uh, from, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the legalistic style, where you know you sit down and every dot and cross T was was looked at, and that that was terrifying. Uh, to <laughs> To the transition period there and then into the way it is now and now it's actually an enjoyable basically camp director uh, extended coffee break in a sense where you walk around camp uh, you know you know that they're they're there for your uh your improvement i guess for lack of a better word um i mean yeah i don't think i've ever had an inspection where i was perfect uh, I've always been de delinquent on some things, right, Kim? And, <laughs> but but there there's always that uh, grace period. There's always that time where you can uh, ha have conversation with Kim or others to to know, you know, what what's the minimum I have to get there to, <laughs> and then move forward from there. And of course, the next one is that much easier because you've already done it. Uh, so yeah. I just, uh, for those that are here for the first time and maybe looking at it, uh, yes, on the, I guess on the surface, it sounds daunting and it sounds scary <laughs> for lack of a better word. Uh, but everyone that comes is interested in making you improve. Uh, and they're not, uh, they're not there to, uh, Say ha ha, caught ya. <laughs> uh, and so that that that's really what I wanted to say is that uh, it's not it's not something to be afraid of. It is something that uh, I think parents are looking for the a safe camp, a safe environment to send their kids, especially now after COVID mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So uh, I would, uh, yeah. The first year I came to Turtle, they were not accredited, so I had the great privilege of working through all the paperwork. And that's, I guess, a question I have is every three years when you hand in paperwork, is it everything again? Or is it just the, the things that need to be updated? 
It would just be the updated items, Howard. Yeah. And with us switching to digital, it's going to be take us a little bit of figuring that piece out, right? That it would be the onus on the camp um, to just say, here are these like 10 sheets that were changed from the previous year. So we so we have that. Um, you know, like one of them, of course, is going to be the insurance document, but there might be some things you've changed in your policies, or there might be some things you've changed in your job description, um, or, or, or staff applications, things like that. Um, or, you know, what your health record is that uh, the health history that form that you've sent out for staff and for campers, things like that. So just to send those pieces. So it's, it's going to be something too, that I know we're going to be fine tuning, like over these next few years, as we're switching to it being digital as well as to what is that exactly going to look like. I'm sure there'll be a few little um, bumps and bruises along the way that we'll try to sort out and stuff, but to have virtually like every camp to have that di digital document there and available um, for us to see so you don't have to have it like, and if you keep your own printed binder up, sometimes going through it, I would often have a staff member, a senior staff member go through it, or at least their section and say, no, this is old. We've got to update this piece. We have to update that piece. So we had like the MCA standards um, binder with all the things needed for that. And you could do that digitally then to keep it that way as well. And then I even had like a separate binder, which I know Connor and Carly knows the red binder um, that was like everything we needed four camps even beyond what was in the standards manual that just every kind of report operational procedure and stuff was was in there so it's it's similar to that but not quite as as involved um if that helps at all yeah yeah and i think one one of the things i did especially in the last accreditation is i took the binder and uh, like if i had a waterfront director and i just gave them the waterfront section you do that it wasn't necessarily I, I'm not familiar with all the waterfront, but they are the same way with the horsemanship and different things like that. So I divided it out amongst some of my key staff. Uh, number one, it got them familiar with what the regulations are and what what the, and that sort of thing. I was still ultimately responsible to put it all together, but uh, the legwork was done with other people involved. And so it's a great, <laughs> can you call it team building? I'm not sure, but, <laughs> but it, is, it is something that other people can get involved with. It's not necessarily just the camp director. Yeah. Even board members could be involved in it, camp board members and, and whatever. It's a great, uh, because I think it's important for them to realize there's a lot of uh, safety issues and a lot of things that uh, goes on behind the scenes, not just the kids are coming and uh, let's have fun. There's a lot of behind the scenes and I think other people involved in that process uh, speaks volumes to all the work that goes on in camp. Thanks very much, Howard. Thanks for your comments too about the evolution of the accreditation process. And I do, I do remember as a staff member, I don't know that it was ever the intention of the MCA visiting committees, but there was this sort of really intense kind of atmosphere around some of those visits. And I remember that as a staff member experiencing that, like, ah, oh, they're coming for an accreditation visit today. And then, and again, I don't know that that was ever the intention, but I think the spirit of it is how can we help you be the best? And how can we as an industry be the best? We all benefit from camps wanting to be involved in accreditation. And I know I've talked a little bit, I haven't talked about some of the specific benefits in case people aren't aware, right? So to, part to participate in our Sunshine Fund funding, you need to be an accredited camp as an example. But additionally, and I, I, what I, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, if people are not aware of how much kind of, I would say lobbying, Kim on behalf of the MCA has done for camps during, this pandemic, even compared to other provinces, it's very significant. And that's something that all camps benefit from. And I hope that people can see that as also as a benefit of their heightened participation in the MCA. So I, I uh, yeah, we, we uh, yeah, we all, we all do better. Um, when camps want to be accredited and we help each other pursue that that goal but does anyone ever have any other comments or questions i would run over time here 
I just yes, have one Jenna, question. Yeah. Um, Kim, are you able, like for those of us that are new, are you able to get us the paperwork that would have been submitted in the past to see if it's changed or not? Or is that something I should try to look for on my end? Like you have them. Um, I can give you their last report from, okay. because now I think last year was supposed to be your visit, but I know it's actually interesting. We have been out to at least a couple of us to Cedarwood every year, but never for an official accreditation visit. Yeah. Like since I've been here and just cause there are some questions, um, like doing a pre-visit one year, wanting to have some clarification again, it was one of those, we're in the area, do you want us to come by and stuff and to look at some things? Yeah. So I can give you the information that I have from those um, hey. visits. No, we did have, actually the first year, I think Maybe there was, there was there. one. Yeah, yeah, we did. Sorry about that. Yeah, I've and been so I'll give you not in this job, but I've been around and whatever. Yeah. No visits have happened, but yeah, yeah. So the one, and then the two other years that we went by there, because it was supposed to be then your next, the, the third visit, third year visit happening last year. That's what it was. Right. I'll find the information that I have here, um, okay. the report. I'll send that to you so you can take a peek at it and see what some of those things were. I know um, Rick, he was there. I do believe that first visit, yeah. we sat and we talked with him. He's sitting here with me. Yeah, I keep too. seeing him back there. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, he was there for that visit. I know too, that we talked with him at length for quite a while about some different things and he helped us understand some stuff. So I'll, um, I'll send you what I have so you can look at that and then go from cool. there. Cool. Um, it used to be too that the MCA had every camp like submit their entire hard copy papers the binder of all the policies and things and we yeah Howard you're right and we stopped doing that because that just it wasn't useful for us to store that and to have that here at the office um and so that's why we spent like I want to say we easily spend a good hour plus at some camps looking through the paperwork to ensure all those kinds of forms and things that we need to see are there and in okay. place. Um, you know, what's your procedure for fire emergency? What about weather situations? You know, that might come up, things like that. Where's your permit um, for this? Where's the proof of this person being having their NLS or whatever it is? So it's like we literally would go through binders and binders and binders upon papers and with a team of even three and four people sometimes, like it still took that long because then you start talking, asking questions about stuff and getting clarification or the directors are asking, saying, hey, do we have to or this is what we have? Is this enough? Do you need more kind of thing? So it's not nothing that I, we ever want to have rushed, um, but we think that submitting that digital piece then will help to spend more time just kind of talking about things at camp as a tour there. And if it's going to take like four or five hours again, that's fine, right? It's just, it's good to um, just chat about and see those different things that are, that are happening there. Thanks. Thank if, I, if, I, if, if I could just say one more thing is uh, I think over time I'm, I'm learning even after uh, 40 years in camping ministry <laughs> to try and put all those things in one spot, uh, mm -hmm. even even on your computer, uh, because I'm notorious for not being organized <laughs> and, and so on. But uh, that's the one thing I think MCA has actually taught me is, uh, you know, putting it in one spot so it's easy to find. So I now have a file right on my desktop, MCA, and if there's something that I have to put in it, <laughs> yes, thanks, Kim. <laughs> uh, and and so on. Is it all there? No, but the majority of it is like, you, you know, and, and they're all just the PDF copies and whatever. I still have to work on my paperwork part part of it, you know, the, the on-site or the hands-on stuff. But uh, but I'm just finding that uh, that that's makes it so much easier when the team comes through. Uh, even if you don't have it in paper, you got it digitally, you know, you can hit a print button and there it is. So it's, it's there. Uh, and then they can advise you otherwise as to know you should have a paper copy of that over there or whatever, especially like your, uh, your safety data sheets and, and that sort of thing in the different locations. So anyway, just another comment. I should keep quiet. <laughs> um. I'm, I'm conscious of the time here. I know I can see there's a quarter after one and I know people have things to do. If there are any pressing questions right now, we can address them, I think. But I will also say that if you, an hour from now or a day from now, you're like, oh, I wish I had asked X, Y, Z. Don't hesitate to contact um, to contact Kim about, about your questions. Does anyone have anything right now? Well, th thanks so much for 
attending and uh, and your input and your questions and it can be daunting, I think, for those of you considering accreditation for the very first time at your camp, but it's very exciting. And uh, I, uh, I, I hope um, that, uh, that you experience some enthusiasm in the process as well, because it's exciting to, to help your camp improve and be the best that it, that it can be, so. Or maybe get the recognition for having had, you know, had all those things in place anyway. So great. Thank you so much, Connor. Um, appreciate you just giving your time and planning, preparing for this and sharing your own experiences as well from so many different perspectives, right? That's, that's really great. And thank you to those of you who asked questions and gave information because it's like Connor has said, we learn so much from each other as well. And it's so much, I, I feel like so much for the MCA, we've kind of fostered this, um, just let's work together and help each other out. We're, we're, we're trying to make camp happen in whatever different ways they happen at our, at our camps. Um, but there's some things that are definitely the same in that accreditation piece or programming piece, whatever. Um, so please, thank you for reaching out to each other and helping each other out as you do, because that just makes us a stronger and better organization. So thank you to you all for being here and giving this time. Thank you, Connor, um, so much for presenting. Great. We Thanks. appreciate it greatly. Yay. Thanks everyone.